I'm Dr. Herbert Bailey, and this is my wife, Dr. Marsha Bailey. I'm known to challenge you in your faith, and she's known to encourage you to never give up. But ultimately, we're here to give you practical steps to get positive results in your life. Heading in the right direction. 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 Today's message is Forced Faith by Dr. Herbert Bailey. God will force you to live by faith so you will know that he can defy the odds. Say that I can defy the odds. The odds mean when it's statistically against you. The odds mean when the numbers aren't in your favor. Whether that's financial numbers, whether that's numbers of biological tests, whether that's blood count or sperm count or egg count or money count. Come on now. I, I, my mother used to say when I was a little boy, now, when, when I, I, was, I, I, I think I was in junior high, and I should need help with, my, with, with homework sometime. And my mother would come over and try to help me, and my mother would say, this that new math. <laughs> Did, any, any of your mama ever talk about that new math? The new math simply means I don't know how to do it. Okay. Let me let y'all know, God works some new math. God will work some math that does not make sense in the natural. God works math that you can't calculate and put in your calculator. You all ever try to put certain numbers in there and all of a sudden you, you get to certain number and just come up with E. <laughs> let me tell you, e, e on the calculator means error. E on God's calculator means L should die. More than enough, glory to God, the almighty God. Stop trying to figure me out. Just trust me that I am El Shaddai. I am more than enough. Stop trying to put everything in the calculator and calculate it and, and add the numbers up. It's not going to add up. When you are in deficit, when you are in debt, it does not add up that if you take away one dime out of every dollar, some kind of way you're going to make ends meet. That is, that's that new math. That's God kind of math. God says, first he says, I will add to you. Then he says, I will multiply you. And then, then, then God said, and then, then the blessing going to overrun you and overshadow you and, and chase you down. So then he says stuff like this. He said, in blessing, I'll bless you. And in multiplying, I'll multiply you. We call that exponentially to the power, to the power. God, to the El Shaddai power, to the Jehovah Jireh power, to the God kind of power. He will bless you in a way that you cannot figure it out. This does not make sense. It doesn't seem like how you got here this fast, but you get God's speed on your life and things start happening. Things start accelerating that if you had worked for years and tried to save for years to make this thing happen, it would not have happened, but God performs his math on your life. Woo, that's a good word right there. Hallelujah. So when it doesn't add up, when it doesn't make sense, say, God, just do your math. Glory to God. God defies the odds. Do the Deuteronomy 20 chapter and verse 1. This is actually one of my favorite victory scriptures. Y'all know if you, one of the themes of my ministry is, is victory. I preach about victory I, because, because I've been through enough in life to know that you can go through things that can make you despondent in life. You can go through things that will make you want to give up. You can go through things that make you just throw your hands up. You can go through things, listen, y'all, where you stop looking for a breakthrough and just settle for a break. <laughs> Some of us stop looking for a breakthrough, say, I, 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 I believe God for a breakthrough. <laughs> Forget breakthrough. In fact, just get a break. <laughs> get a break from these bills, a break from these kids, break from this job. A break from the stress. God don't just want you to have a break. I want you to keep believing God for your breakthrough. Somebody say, I'm still believing God for my breakthrough. 
what's the difference between a break and a breakthrough? A breakthrough, you just stop. In a, I mean, in a, in a break, you just stop. In a breakthrough, you, you keep on going despite wanting to stop until you get to the other side of that thing. Somebody say, I'm going to get to the other side of this thing. That's what a breakthrough is, a breakthrough. Everything seems to be pressing against you. Seems like you can't make it. All the odds are against you. But if you stay in faith, God's not, not going to give you a break, just refreshing, but God will give you restoration. God will give you compensation. Are uh, you hearing me here? Not just resurrection. God will give you compensation. God still wants us to keep believing him for a breakthrough. So he said in Deuteronomy 20 chapter, he said, now when you go into battle, out, out to battle, Notice it says when, not if. If you live long enough, you're going to have battles. Amen. When thou goest out to battle against your enemies, and you see horses, and you see chariots, and you see people that are more than you, be not afraid of them. He said you see people that are more than you. We would simply say when you are outnumbered in the natural. God says be not afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with thee, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You'll notice in the scriptures, God's always going back, reminding them that I brought you out of the, out of the land of Egypt. Because God bringing them out of the land of Egypt was the greatest miracle that they had ever seen and that the earth had ever seen up until that time. We, we could venture to say even period. I mean, there, there, there's some others maybe you might want to argue about where, where uh, uh, who was it, Joshua prayed and the sun stood still, okay? I mean, there are other men, but up until this time, God, nobody has seen anything. Like God opened up the Red Sea, and two million people walked across on dry land. Now, if you go to the wrong cemetery, I mean seminary, um, they'll... They'll, you'll pay and they'll try to teach you to not believe God's word. So I heard about a young man was at in seminary and he was teaching on this and, he, and they asked him to prepare a message. He, he prepared a message how God opened up the Red City, went across the dry land. And so the, the professor got up and said, you need to understand what well, back that time geologically and geographically and, and historically, uh, it, it's been shown that there was a great drought in Egypt and the land at that time and his famine and all that. And so there really wasn't much water in the Red Sea. And that's why the children of Israel were able to go across. As a matter of fact, he said, it was really only about two inches of water. And the, the man preparing the message got all the more excited. He was being calm before. He says only two, he said, oh, glory to God, hallelujah! What you so excited? He said, what a mighty God we serve. God killed Pharaoh and his whole army in two inches of water. You got to get to the place that you let nothing or nobody stop you from trusting and believing God is a miracle working God. That God is a God of more than enough. So he says, when you go out, he says, and it shall be. That when you come nigh unto the battle, on the Sunday before the battle, that the pastor shall approach and speak to the people in the 11 o'clock service. And the pastor shall tell them, hear, O right direction, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Does that sound like what Jesus said in John 14 and 1? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, being also, believe also in me. Do you realize it is a choice what you, let, what you let affect your heart? Crisis, I realize I was teaching this week. Crisis is a choice. Because what is a crisis to you is never a crisis to God. Let me say that again. What is a crisis to you is never a crisis to God. When you're crying, it doesn't shock about what's not there. God, God, God says, oh, my goodness, I, I wasn't expecting this. I, I, I wasn't prepared for them to deal with this. It is never a shock with God what you go through. So, because God already has a plan. And so he says, when you come nigh to the battle, the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them, hear, O Israel, you approach this day battle against your enemy. Don't you let your heart faint. Get yourself together. 
Fear not. Do not tremble. Stop shaking. Do not tremble. Neither be terrified because of them. Why? Can you read verse 4 with me? For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to do what? To fight for you against your enemies to save you. God said, stop worrying that you're outnumbered. Don't get upset because it looks like there's more with them than with you. He said, when you see the chariots and the horse and look like they got more resources, they got more people with them, they have more on their side, it looks like this, everything lining up for them and against you. God said, don't you be afraid because the Lord goes with you so he can fight for you. I said last week that when the enemy thinks he has you surrounded, God has your enemy surrounded. When the enemy thinks he has you trapped, God is actually entrapping your enemies. So when you think it's happening to you, it's actually happening for you because God wants the people live by faith to know that you can defy the odds. Say, I can defy the odds. Let me go, let me go as directed by God this morning. Look at John, the sixth chapter. In the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. Hmm. Subtopic God math. <laughs> in John 6, after these things, Jesus went over the sea of Galilee, and he was in the sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude, great hosts of people followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And at and the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and looked, which shows us he really wasn't focusing on the people. Because when he finally licks up his eyes and looks, he saw a great company come unto him. He said unto Philip, whence, we don't say whence today, we say what? Okay, five of y'all know who can interpret the Bible. Where, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Notice, first of all, a couple things. Jesus asked, where? And he asked, by. Where? Um, where's the closest Walmart? Where? So, first thing Jesus said, he said, where, can, where are we going to get it from? And then he says, where shall we buy? Which means he, they had some money. Well, first thing Jesus said, where shall we buy? And when the disciples look, now, come on, if you've been in this ministry for any time, you should have verse 6 highlighted. And this he said to prove him or test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, there's 5,000, come on, let, let's, let's get it right, 5,000 families. Not 5,000 people. 5,000 families, because the Bible says it didn't count women and children. It's 5,000 families. Let's say conservatively, a wife and one child. But y'all know they didn't have no birth control, so let's say conservatively, a wife and three children. Because sometimes it takes a while to figure out what was causing these babies. I didn't find out until after four. Let me y'all get that. 15, 20,000 people, and Jesus said, where are we going to buy food that, uh, that these may eat? And this he said to prove them or test them. To prove what? To test what? To test, come on, somebody say it over here. To test what? To test their faith. When you're in a situation and it looks like the odds are too much, God says, let me see if I can locate your faith. When you're in a situation that it seems overwhelming, God's trying to locate your faith. When you're in a situation that you don't have enough money to meet the bill, God is testing your faith. He's, he said to prove them, to test them, or to locate where they were, how they were thinking. Because even though they had been with him, the word had not necessarily penetrated all of them. Now, look at this. He said it to prove them, 
The next part says what? Come on, in the verse 6, put it up, come on. Read, read the next part, come on, read, read after the colon with me. For he himself knew. You all see that? You know what that means? This wasn't a surprise to him. Jesus was not trying to figure this out as he went along. You trying to figure it out as you go along. It said, but he himself, he already knew what he's going to do. I know you're in a dilemma. I know you got debt. I know you got bills. I know you got marriage problems. I know you're believing this for your children. You don't know what you're going to do, but he knows what he's going to do. And so what he's saying is, even when you don't know what you're going to do, can you trust that I still got a plan? Can you trust that I know what I'm doing with your life? Can you trust that what freaks you out don't freak me out? Can you trust that what makes you nervous don't make me nervous? Okay? And so, uh, but I haven't, I haven't been to the fair. I haven't been to the fair since my kids, I don't know. I remember last time when we were, I think we were still up here on uh, we, we, the church was still small, and I remember God still had my suit on, my sh- tie, and I went to the fair, and my kids asked me to get on this, this ship that go back and forth like this. <laughs> That's the last time I was at the fair. <laughs> I didn't throw up, but I almost threw up. And I'm not sure if, if it was before that or after that, they got me down, at, down there at Universal Studios and, put, and got me on the Hulk. I think I confess whatever I had ever done. <laughs> Everything. I repented. I promised the Lord, if you just let me off of this thing, I won't lie again. I won't cheat again. I will pray five hours a day. Forgive me, Jesus, for not keeping it. But I promised him, <laughs> Lord Jesus. And, and all that stuff been about 10, 15 years ago. I have not been on anything since. And even though I may be fearful of getting on one of those things, God already knows he's going to protect me. See, what scares you don't scare God. Amen? That, that's what you have to understand. This he said to prove him. Now, let's, let's keep going here. If I don't get to my, all oh, my notes, that's good because I'm just flowing as God directed me today. Verse 7, and Philip said, Philip said, 200 penny worth. A penny is about a day's wages. So this is about five months of wages. He's thinking, well, maybe if we had five months, one month wages might feed 1,000 or something. I don't know. He said it, 200 penny worth, almost a half a year's or wages or so, um, is not enough. It's not sufficient for them. It's not enough that everyone can even take a little. Notice how they're thinking. They're thinking a little. They're thinking just enough. And one of, verse 8 is a powerful verse. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says to him, well, there's a lad, there's a little boy over here, which has five barley loaves. I used to like to call them barley loaves because they were barely loaves. <laughs> we have five barley loaves and two small fish. Now watch this. But what are they among so many? Now, come on, most of us, we know this story. How did Jesus feed the 5,000? With the five loaves and the two fish. Simon, uh, Andrew says, there's a boy here, he got five loaves and two fish. But uh, what's that among so many? Can you back up to verse 6? The latter part of that verse says what? He himself knew what he would do. So Jesus already knew that there was a boy there. You're catching me. Jesus already knew there was a boy there who had five barley loaves and two fish, and Jesus already knew he's going to do something with these five barley loaves and two fish. Andrew taps into that. Andrew said, well, there's a boy here, got five loaves of bread and two fish, that's a supernatural thought. As faith people, sometimes our first thought is a supernatural thought. He tapped into the mind of Christ. When the Bible said we had the mind of Christ, right? 
He tapped into the mind of Christ because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. See, I think the way most of us read this is that Jesus, at, Jesus was looking for some ideas. Y'all got any ideas? Y'all come and, uh, well, so, uh, and, and so uh, Andrew said, well, there's five loaves and, and two fish. Y'all, and Jesus said, well, well, that's a good idea. I'll use that idea. No. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He was trying to see, are you thinking like me? Faith thinks like God. Are you thinking that this is a good time for a miracle? (laughs) Are you thinking that this is a perfect opportunity for God to defy the odds? Are you thinking that this is a time for God to show up and show out? Or are you only thinking natural? Andrew tapped into it at first, but then he discounted it. It's called, I taught on this book, it's the second thought. The second thought is that natural thought. The first thought is a supernatural thought. Supernatural math. God's math. God can do anything. That second thought is, but I don't don't make enough money. First thought is, God can give me a house. Second thought is, but my credit ain't so good. First thought is, I'm going to give $1,000 for direction for life. Second thought, where that going to come from? <laughs> that first thought many times comes out of our spirit. It's a thought of faith. But then you start looking, okay, first thought, Jesus, if that's you, let me come on out there with you. Peter comes out and walks. Second thought, what in the world am I doing? The first thought made him bold enough to ask to come and do what Jesus did. I, oh, this is so good. The first thought is, I can do what Jesus does. You're going to catch that. I said, the first thought is, I can do what Jesus does. As he is, so am I in this world. I can do what Jesus does. The, the, the second thought said, but you just flesh and blood. But I'm only human. And Jesus, let's keep reading here. I, I got something this week. Somebody shared something. Mike Smith shared something I want to share with you all because it's good stuff here. He said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number. The men, about 5,000. He told them to sit down. Will you read that? Look, look at the, uh, let me see here. What verse am I at here? I'm verse 10. The Amplified said, now Jesus said, make all the people recline. Sit down. Now the grass, a pasture, was covered with thick grass at the spot. So the men threw themselves down. About 5,000 in number. Jesus said, tell the folks to lay down. Chill out. I know you're sweating. I know you're trying to work three jobs, but will you just sit down? Will you just recline? Recline means stop trying to make it happen yourself. Recline. Sit down. And The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me. To, uh, uh, he, he, what? <laughs> to lie down where? In green. Let's lay, lay, just lay down. You sweating, you stressing, and God said, would you just lay down? I got this. Trust me. When he told them to lay down, still all they got is five loaves and two fish. I was reading something a couple weeks ago. It said even sheep will only drink besides still waters. It said you can't feed sheep if the waters are troubled. And bubbling, because they're afraid it could be an alligator or a crocodile or something in there. Sheep only feed and drink besides still waters. God says, my provision is going to show up when you calm down. You will see my hand when you remove all your works out the equation. 
because I've settled this for you already. Are you ready to go to another level in your faith journey? God will sometimes put you in a place that you will not have any other choice but to trust Him. Dr. Herbert Bailey explains how God uses forced faith to get you where He wants you to be. Get these resources today. Just call 1-877-798-LIFE or go online to rightdirection.info. Ask for Forced Faith. What is manhood? Is it my job? Is it my money? Is it my sport? Is it my habit? Nah, it's gotta be more than that. It's my heart. It's my strength. I am man. It's my faith. It's my focus. I am man. It's my love. It's my character. It's who I am. I am man. The Right Direction Men's Conference 2015, MOD. Next time on Daily Direction. God want to work a miracle through your hands. God want to work a miracle at your house. God want to work a miracle on your job. But you got to trust him that even when the odds are against me, God can still work a miracle with me, for me, and through me. Somebody shout hallelujah. If you are in our area, come join us at one of our three locations. In Columbia, South Carolina, Sunday morning worship is at 7.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Wednesday Bible study is at 12 noon and 7 p.m. Friday, Women's Bible Study is at 12 noon. Our worship center is located at 3506 Broad River Road in Columbia. In Orangeburg, South Carolina, join us with campus pastors Trey and Katie Brave for Sunday morning worship at 1030 a.m. and Tuesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. We're located at 990 Willington Drive in Orangeburg. In Florence, South Carolina, join us with campus pastors Dwayne and Denise White for Sunday morning worship at 1030 a.m. and Tuesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. We're located at 1507 King Avenue in Florence. Please email your testimonies to praise report at rightdirection.info or letters can be mailed to P.O. Box 21672, Columbia, South Carolina 29221. Please consider partnering with us or send a one-time financial gift. For more information, visit our website at rightdirection.info or call us toll free at 877-798-5433. Right Direction Ministries, empowering people and changing generations.